This is my Bible. It is the Word of God, and it is the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am, seated right now in Christ Jesus, in the heavenly realms, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine, and I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive as I'm taught the Word of God. My life has changed for the better, and I will never be the same again. Amen. You may be seated. This message is a a double. It is a continuation in our series, The Miracle of Seed, Faith, Giving, but it's also the first message in our Mastering Money series of 2022. The Sunday morning series we're in right now, The Miracle of Seed, Faith, Giving, is from an Oral Roberts book by the same title. And in case the name Oral Roberts is not familiar to you. Oral Roberts was one of my fathers in the faith, and he was the greatest American healing evangelist of the 20th century. A little known fact is that one of Oral Roberts' last sermons was called The Blessing, and in that message preached in a church in Florida, Oral specifically spent much of the message teaching on the power of tithing. He actually tells a story about how he was healed through this power. And Oral Roberts' last sermon was preached in Oklahoma to a small Indian church on a reservation. That message was on vows and was called Hold the Rope. And in that message, he mentioned tithing and taught on giving and receiving as well. Now, while Austin and I were doing our best in the Sunday series, The Miracle of Seed Faith Giving, to convey truths on giving and receiving from the Oral Roberts book by the same title. One of the most famous ministers in America preached sermons against tithing on Sunday, June 26, and Sunday, July 3, 2022. Now, this man used to be Word of Faith, but he has in recent years gone apostate with the hyper-grace message, and now he has condemned tithing. What happened was the little scaredy-cat closed his church for two years for COVID, two whole years. And when he finally worked up the guts to reopen his church, he was so appalled at the attendance, he came out against tithing to try and help his attendance. Today, he'll probably condone drinking. Next Sunday, he'll probably condone drug use. The Sunday after that, he'll probably condone fornication, adultery, and abortion. This is the path these churches are going down to try and get back to their pre-COVID numbers. Well, we have surpassed our pre-COVID numbers at St. Paul's. We have surpassed our pre-COVID numbers on Wednesday nights, and we are within spitting distance of surpassing our pre-COVID numbers on Sunday morning, and we have not knuckled under, and we have not gone apostate, and we have not backed up off the Word of God, not one inch. How about having some guts and how about having some faith? And oddly enough, it's all about money. Money, 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 money. (laughs) Money. (laughs) Now you hear me. I do not believe it's coincidence. It's not the virgin birth being attacked. It's not the sinless life of Jesus being attacked. It's tithing being attacked. Now, you hear me now. And in my understanding, this goes hand in hand with this new thing, this new Bernie Sanders thing of making God government, making government God, making government source, and also the whole Bernie Sanders thing of do nothing and still get a check. It's very convenient. After he has his mega church building, after he has his personal mansion, 
after he and his wife have their matching Rolls-Royce automobiles, after he has his huge private jet, after he has all of that, then to come out and condemn tithing in order to help increase church attendance. Now, what people don't think through is this. When this man condemned tithing, he called Oral Roberts a liar. When he condemned tithing, he called Fred Price a liar. When he condemned tithing, he called John Osteen a liar. When he condemned tithing, he called the Apostle Paul a liar. When he condemned tithing, he called the Lord Jesus a liar. And he condemned millions of poor Americans to continue in poverty. And because it instantly hit the news in Africa, he condemned millions of Africans to continued poverty. The arrogance is literally breathtaking. While I was watching Austin speaking on Wednesday evening, August 3rd, 2022, the Holy Spirit said to me, if these men say that Jesus' words don't apply today, what are they but antichrists? And that lines up with 1 John 2, 18 and 19. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. They went out from us. Apostasy does not come from outside the church. Apostasy comes from inside the church. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. If these modern preachers had been alive in the days of 2 Kings or 2 Chronicles, the time frame between Solomon until the exiling of both Israel and Judah to foreign lands, they would not have acted like Elijah or Elisha or Isaiah. They would have compromised and then done their utmost to make the Chemosh worshipers and the Asherah worshipers and the Baal worshipers comfortable in the temple of God. We live in days like those of Judges 17, 6, or 21, 25. We live in days when everyone does what is right in their own eyes, even ministers. It says in those verses, in those days there was no king in Israel. That means no leadership. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. The Apostle Paul specifically warned his protege in the ministry, Timothy, about such days in 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 to 5, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction, for the time is coming when men will not put up with sound doctrine, Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge your duties, discharge the duties of your ministry." And in 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, Paul wrote, The Spirit clearly says that in the latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving things, deceiving spirits, and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Now ministers who embrace the hyper-grace message eventually teach that once a Christian is born again, they never again need to confess their sins or repent ever. This is nonsense. Such teaching contradicts the New Testament and the fact that in the book of Revelation, Jesus himself says to believers in the, in the churches to repent. That's Revelation 2, 5, 2, 16, 3, 3, and 3, 19. Because their teachings deny the Bible and verses which are very clear about Christians repenting and asking forgiveness like 1 John 1, 9. These people wrongly claim that 1 John was not written to believers. And that is why people ought to go to school. Friday, Ken Hagen told me on the phone, there's something all these people have in common, and that is they're ignorant and they're uneducated. Tell your neighbor, people ought to go to school. 
tell the neighbor on the other side, somebody ought to go to school. Because no scholar, even no liberal scholar in 2,000 years has made the ridiculous claim that 1 John was not written to believers. 1 John begins with the words, my dear children. Hypergrace teachers also teach the erroneous doctrine of once saved, always saved, that there is nothing a Christian can ever do to lose their salvation. This teaching ignores the warnings of the New Testament for believers to live a pure, holy, and righteous life, and the fact, as Hebrews says so clearly, that it is possible for a believer to drift away and to ultimately reject Christ. Hebrews also warns against apostasy, which ministers in America are committing today. Again, people should go to school and get educated. Now, let's deal with it. And the message this morning is in defense of tithing. First fruits or tithing is a principle that did not begin with the law of Moses. When people say that this that uh, tithing is, uh, is, is the law of Moses. They're ignorant, they're ignorant, they're ignorant. Dear God, dear God, dear God, save me from ignorant people. <laughs> first fruits or tithing is a principle that did not begin with the law of Moses. Abel gave God first fruits while Cain gave God some. Genesis 4, beginning in verse 1, Adam lay with his wife, Steve, up. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. How did she know it was a man? <laughs> Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. How did she know he was a brother? Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some. Everybody shout some. Some. Of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought fat portions of some of the firstborn. Everybody shout firstborn. firstborn. Of his flock, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. And we're not going to deal with it this week, but they go hand in hand. They go fist in glove, the offering and the favor. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry. And his face was downcast. These people are angry. These people are angry. These people are angry. I mean, you know, when they don't smile and they scowl all the time. I mean, what kind of a minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is angry all the time? Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, if you do what is right. And see, this is the apostasy. They say it doesn't matter what you do. This is just nonsense. If somebody ties and somebody doesn't ties, they're going to get a different result. If somebody saves money, somebody doesn't save money, they're going to get a different result. If somebody counts their calories, somebody doesn't count their calories, they're going to get a different result. This is life. Tell your neighbor, this is life. If you do what is right, will not you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Say, you must master it. Must master. Now look at verse 8. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. So the first murder on planet earth was committed over money and tithing, the giving of first fruits unto the Lord who created the earth. And from this passage, we learn the following. Cain brought some of the fruits of his labors and offering to the Lord. Verse 3, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. We learn Abel brought the fat portions from the firstborn of his flock. Verses 3 and 4, but Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. We see that the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering an offering of that which was first. The Lord looked, verse 4, with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. We also learn that the Lord did not look with favor on Cain and his offering, an offering of that which was some, not the first some. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. And we learn that rather than imitate, 
we learn that rather than imitate what Abel has done so as to get the results Abel got, Cain got very angry and killed his brother Abel. We see that in verse 8, Cain attacked his brother. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. That's what's going on. That's what 2020 is all about, man. It's covetousness. It's anger. It's jealousy. It's wanting what the other guy's got. All these 38 and one half years since we pioneered Faith Christian Center, we have taught the good people the word of God. And that is you are not to covet your neighbor's wife. You are not to covet your neighbor's car. You are not to covet your neighbor's job. You, you are authorized by God, however, to go out and get your own. And God will help you. We also find out that God told Cain that if he did what was right, he too would be accepted. The Lord, verse 7, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Shout it out loud. You must master it. That's what this week is about. You must master it. You got to master it. Look, you'll either master your money or your money will master you. You'll either be in charge of your money or your money will be in charge of you. You'll either run your money or your money will run you. Do what was right, but that's what people don't want to hear. Do what is right, but that's what people don't want to hear. Do what is right. Follow the pattern. Imitate Abel. Do what is right, but that's what people don't want to hear. They don't want to hear that they have to do something to please God. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We got a New Testament on this, Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that uh, sit around and smoke the bong and wait on the check. Now he's a rewarder of them that what? Diligently seek him. If you want God to put you first, then you have to put God first. Say it out loud. If I want God to put me first, then I have to put God first. Now here are four facts about tithing. Everybody ought to, pardon me. Here are four facts about tithing. Everybody ought to know. Number one, Abraham tithed the Melchizedek before the law of Moses was ever given. Abraham tithed to, Mo, to Abraham tithed to Melchizedek before the law of Moses was ever given. Abraham tied to Melchizedek at least 430 years before the law was given to the people of Israel through the prophet of Moses. 430 years. People ought to go to school. 430 years. Genesis 14, verse 17, after Abraham returned from defeating Kedor Lamar and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Say it out loud, a tenth of everything. Amen. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. Look, look, I'm going to be direct. I'm going to be blunt. Every one of these lousy, stinking, apostate preachers took money to give clot shots in their churches. They took COVID loan money. I want you to know that here at Faith Christian Center, we are holding the line. Amen. We are holding the line against apostasy, and we are holding the line against fear, and we are holding the line against the king of Sodom. Amen. We're holding the line. We don't want your damn money. We don't want your damn drugs. We don't want your damn idolatry. We don't want any of it. We are not government worshipers. We're not Fauci worshipers. We are King of King and Lord of Lord worshipers.
There has not been, there is not, and there never will be one dime of government money at Faith Christian Center. Tell your neighbor we're holding the line. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath. Where did I get this from? That I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say I made Abram rich. Number two, Jacob obeyed, four things everybody ought to know about tithing. Number two, Jacob obeyed the tithing principle before the law of Moses was ever given. Jacob obeyed the tithing principle at least 270 years before the law was given to the people of Israel through the prophet Moses. Jacob vowed to give God a tenth of everything that crossed his hands. He got that from his grandfather Abraham and no doubt from his father Isaac. Genesis 28.10, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for <coughs> Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels, angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Notice the angels were not descending and ascending. The angels were ascending and descending. Angels are here, they're working, their job is here. There above it stood the Lord and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south and all peoples will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called that place Bethel, which means the house of God. Though the city used to be called Luz, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up will be a pillar in a, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Now this happened at least 270 years before Moses was ever born. Number three, Jesus confirmed the practice of tithing. Jesus confirmed the pra practice of tithing. In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus confirmed the practice of tithing in the new covenant. And this is also recorded in Luke eleven forty two. 42. So you have two witnesses. Matthew 23, 23, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter, justice, mercy, and faithfulness without neglecting the former, which is tithing. Jesus said you ought to tithe, but not leave the other undone, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And that's true because we have met people who tithe religiously, and yet they neglected justice, mercy, and faithfulness, and the end result was their religion did them no good at all. Now listen, you hear me. That's why at Faith Christian Center we tell you, do not lie to workers. Do not tell them the check's in the mail when the check's not in the mail. If it's some great big corporation, that's one thing. But if it's somebody who comes to your home, a laborer, they need that money. I said a laborer, they need that money. 
Somebody cuts your grass. Somebody does irrigation repairs. Somebody cleans your house. Do not horse poor people around. Are you hearing me? That's what I mean by justice and mercy and faithfulness. And Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, actually he went beyond the tithe. That's what this series is, the miracle of seed faith giving. He went beyond the tithe. Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. This same Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 to 21, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where must and where moth and rust destroyed, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You wonder why they're attacking tithing? You wonder why they're attacking this issue of money? Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, I just don't think, you know, there ought to be this emphasis on money. That's why God doesn't have your heart. And Jesus said, Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now you've got to see from the word of God that God wants you to live in abundance. But God does not bless everybody equally. 66 books of the Bible handed down to us by these holy men of old. I mean, it's nearly on every page. If you live one way, you come under judgment. If you live another way, you come under blessing. It matters how you live. Today we're celebrating our 46th anniversary, you know, and we're oftentimes horrified when all these revelations come out about these various ministers. And I, I'm always telling Sue, you can hire anybody to follow me. You can check my phone, check my email. Whatever you want to do, none of it's password protected. And the most you're ever going to find out about me having an affair with is a pepperoni pizza. <laughs> I say without apology, in these days of heresy and apostasy, these are not the days to live like the world and look like the world and talk like the world. Come out from among them and be separate and live a life wholly devoted to the Lord. Live a life wholly devoted to the Word of God. Live separate from the world. Yeah. And God will bless you. I said God will bless you. Yeah. Number four in the New Covenant the tithe is received by the Lord Jesus. In the New Testament, the tithe is received by the Lord. 35 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord, the writer of the book of Hebrews, most likely Paul dictating to the physician Luke taught tithing in Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7 tells us that under the new covenant, we now present our tithes to him who is declared to be living. That is the Lord Jesus Christ, the high priest of our faith. When we do that, we, the lesser, are blessed by the greater. Hebrews 7 verse 8, in the one case, the tenth is collected by men who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. Beginning in verse 1, this Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abram, Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Say it out loud, a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness, then also king of Salem means king of peace, without father or beginning of days, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the Son of God. He remains a priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is their brothers, even though their brothers 
are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from, a, from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Listen carefully to the language of the New Testament. He collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises, and without doubt, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by men who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. In the one case, that is the Old Testament case, the tithe is collected by men who die, but in the other case, that is the New Testament case, the tithe is collected by him who is declared to be living. Now, in all of the Word of God, there is only one who is declared to be living, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus has been called by God the Father, a high priest in the order of Melchizedek, over and over and over in the book of Hebrews which happens to be in the New Testament, the Bible calls Jesus a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Hence, Jesus is the one who collects our tithe. When we give our tithe in this New Testament era, we give our tithe to the high priest of our faith, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he operates in a certain anointing. He operates in the power of an indestructible life. He has been called by God. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw it with my own eyes. 1989, Sue was with child. The, I don't remember all the t terminology, but the, the fetus, the egg did not get all the way down into the uterus. It was lodged in the tube. We didn't know that. We didn't know that. And of course, as the baby began to grow, the tube couldn't hold it. It burst. We're at Sue's brother's house in Milford, Ohio, 1989, August 1989. We'd just been to Lester Summerall's camp meeting, stopped back in Cincinnati, went to a picnic at Sue's brother's house. Sue said, I don't feel right. Something's amiss. Went up, laid down in one of the beds in the upstairs bedroom. We prayed a prayer. This is our habit. We pray a prayer. We make a decision. We're, we're believing God, but we give it a time, and then if we don't, see an immediate result or a, and a result based on time, then we take a subsequent action. That's how we handled our children. This child will be well by morning, but if that child wasn't well by morning, it happened two or three times over 18 years, well, then we went to the doctor. But we would pray first. Give God an opportunity first. Give, don't, don't go to see 15 doctors, then go to God. Go to God first, that's what we did. But there came a point, she said, I think in uh, wisdom and prudence, we ought to go on down to the hospital. My sister-in-law called her doctor, surgeon, Jewish lady, brilliant surgeon. She said, go to such and such place. I'll meet you there. We get down there. Sue had lost so much blood. Her blood pressure was just uh, barely over zero. I have all this written down, but I wasn't prepared to recite this story this morning. And she's there on the gurney. And these two residents are in the room. And uh, one of the residents says to the other, her blood pressure is such and such. We need to wheel her in for emergency surgery. And the other one said to the first one, she's dead already. And my wife heard that. She raised up off the gurney. She lifted her right hand toward heaven. And she said, I'm a tither. And I will live. And I will not die. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have seen it with my own eyes. I said, I have seen it with my own eyes. I don't want to walk through this life not one day, not in covenant with God. I don't want to get up on Monday or Tuesday or any day of my life and not walk in covenant with God. I want to know that I'm in covenant with God. I want to have power with God. I want to be able to rebuke the devil, hallelujah, and tell him that I'm a tither and I'm going to be blessed by the Lord. Well, Pastor, out of the story end, well, she's sitting right over there. <laughs> this Jesus is the one who collects our tithe. And when we give our tithe in this New Testament era, we give our tithe to the high priest of our faith. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And he operates in a certain anointing, and the anointing he operates in is the power of an indestructible life. He has been called by God a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And now Jesus, who is connected with the power, now receives our tithes, and then he turns around and blesses us, just like Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and Abraham is the one who had the promises. You see, we have the promises, the Word of God. But what we need to do is to add to the promises, the Word of God, the blessing, the power, the anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Melchizedek blessed him who had the promises, and Jesus blesses us who have the promises. If I will give God, now watch it now. If I will give God what God says is his, God will turn around, right around and give me what God says is mine. Amen. See this right here is full of 6,000 promises. This right here is how I know what is mine. But how do I get it? How do I pull the promises from the pages of a book into my life? How do I take what God has promised me and make it mine? How can I get healed by it? How can I buy a house with it? How can I buy a car with it? How can I fill the pantry with it? Well, if I will give God what God says is his, God will give me what God says is mine. Shout it out loud. If I will give to God what God says is his, the tithe, he will give to me what he says is mine. So God's plan is to bless us. God's plan is to bless us so that the world would envy us. God's plan is to bring you into financial security and blessing beyond your wildest dreams. But you can't rob God and walk in his blessings. I said you can't rob God and walk, with his, walk in his blessings. Let me tell you what. This generation is going to be judged most severely. You would not think twice about robbing the government. which means you fear the government more than you fear God. And the exact same people that followed all of Fauci's instructions are the exact same people that wouldn't follow God's instructions. Jeremiah said, heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. For you are the one I praise, O Lord. You are the one I praise. We know who your God is by whose instructions you follow. We know who your God is by who you praise. People come to us and ask questions like, should I tithe on the net or the gross? Dear Lord, people are always looking for ways to give God less and not more. How'd you like for God to look for ways to give you less and not more? We shouldn't be looking for, to see how little we can give. We ought to be looking to see how much we can give. The tithe belongs to God, so we don't give our tithe any more than we give our house payment. It belongs to God. The tithe belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. John Osteen used to teach this exactly the way my home pastor in Detroit used to teach it. The tithe belongs to God, so you haven't actually given God a dime until after your tithes are paid. Luke 6.38 doesn't even apply until you get past the tithe. First, we don't have to have it at Faith Christian Center because all, all these 38 and a half years when someone hears the word of God and won't tithe, God just raises up someone else to be a millionaire and their tithes cover a bunch of folks that don't tithe. Second, God doesn't need it. God's not poor. God is rich. In fact, God is the richest person in the entire universe. Tithing is God's plan to bless us. Tithing is not God's plan to get money from you. Tithing is God's plan to get money to you. Problem is it takes faith. I realize this. It takes faith. Now, if you think I've been hard on these preachers this morning, let me tell you what. These lousy, stinking preachers are 
misrepresenting my beautiful, my wonderful, my gracious, my loving Heavenly Father, and they're painting it like it is some great big Old Testament pain in the rear to live for the Lord. I tell you, I condemn that in no uncertain terms at Faith Christian Center because I have lived for him now 61 years, and I have been a tither all of these years, and all I know is he blesses me, all I know is he answers me, all I know is he keeps me well, all I know is when I call upon him, he heals me, all I know is that he has blessed my life all of these days. I have nothing to bring you this morning but a good report. God is loving, God is gracious, God is kind, and I'll tell you what else, God is powerful. And whatever you give God, God will not, not only replace it, God will multiply it back into your hands. He, he multiplies it into his kingdom and he multiplies it back into our hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a joy. What a privilege. What an honor to live for the Lord. What a joy. What a privilege. What an honor to stand with him. What a joy. What a privilege. What an honor to stand with his word. What a joy. What a privilege. What an honor to serve him. What a joy. What a privilege. What an honor to fearlessly proclaim his word. What a joy. What a privilege. What an honor to walk with God through life as a journey of faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's beautiful. He's wonderful. He's gracious. He's kind. He's marvelous. Hallelujah. And anybody that paints it as a big burden or a pain to serve God is lying to you through their teeth. He's wonderful. Hallelujah. He's wonderful. Let's bow our heads. You may be here this morning and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord and the Savior of your life. You've been in church. You've been around church. You've been around the things of God, but you've never personally, you've never individually made Jesus Christ the Lord and the Savior of your life. You can do that right now. In fact, I want to pray with you. Jesus said in John chapter 3, you must be born again said in Revelation 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him and he with me. You know what that means? You got to do something. You got to invite him. You got you to do what the word says. Paul, Paul wrote that if we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. The Bible also says that Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's not up to God, it's up to you. How many this morning would say, Pastor, I, I want to be saved, I want to be born again, I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want to know this wonderful, gracious, loving, forgiving Father that you have spoken of this morning. Pastor, pray for me. I want to be saved, I want to be born again, I want to be forgiven of my sins. If that's you this morning, wherever you are, lift a hand up, lift it up wherever you are. God's going to see, God's going to answer, God's going to meet us. You may be here this morning, as we mentioned in the message, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You could be here this morning and you're away from God, you're backslidden, you're not living for the Lord like you know you should. Well, you don't have to stay in that backslidden condition. You can repent, you can turn, you can make it right, you can... Ask God to forgive you of your sins and to restore unto you the joy of your salvation. How many this morning would say, Pastor, that's me. I want to recommit myself to God. I want to make it right. I want to live for God from this day to my last day. Pastor, that's me. Pray for me. If that's you, wherever you are, lift a hand up. Lift it up high enough to where I can see it. We're going to pray. Father, we do have a hand. All right. Anyone else? Let's stand up then if you raised your hand for either invitation. I want you to join me here at the front. Uh, if you raise your hand for either invitation, take what you brought with you to service 
in hand and join me here at the front. I don't want you to be thinking about your stuff, your purse or your cell phone or whatever. Just gather your belongings, step boldly into the aisle, join me here at the front, we're going to pray. And let me say this, you may not have raised your hand, but God is gracious, God's kind, God's loving, so he could be dealing with you. He could be, you know what he's doing? He's pulling you, he's drawing you, he's calling you. And so you're welcome to come. Make your way to the front, we're going to pray. Hallelujah. Well, for the sake of those online, whether somebody walks the aisle or not, let's pray the prayer for the sake of those watching online. Father God, Father God time's gone by, time's gone, gone by. my own way. Gone. I've done my own thing and I've lived for self. But today I turn and I repent of that old way of living and I give you my life. I ask that you would forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, purify me, sanctify me, Take out of me a hard heart and put within me a heart that loves you, loves your word, and loves your house. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everyone in agreement said amen. Amen. Why don't we lift our hands and say, thank you, Father God. You're wonderful. Thank you, Father God. You're beautiful. It's my joy to live for you and to honor your word all the days of my life. Hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. I love them.